Well, hey folks, it's your old pal King Waspinator here. Welcome back to Total Party Skills. Be sure to hit like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Uh, I've been writing a lot lately, so I've been a little neglectful of actually putting out like regular content on this channel. And I'm sure that y'all who've hit the subscribe button or, or would hit the subscribe button right now haven't only done so just so they can hear me talk about my own games. So there's been something I have seen, like, you know, in the last week or so, every once in a while on Twitter, in the gaming sphere of Twitter, that kind of sticks in my craw a little bit that I'd like to talk about, and uh, that's this kind of reflexive, derogatory way some people dump on storytelling games. Now, I get it. There's there's a sub-faction of gamers that come from theater nerds, and they like to talk. And when you're having your players constantly talk in character, it's real easy as a DM to kind of be bowled over by it and be convinced to just go ahead and allow them to talk NPCs and to do those various things. Because, you know, like maybe you don't have quite the same theater background, so you, you're not coming up with stuff on the fly quite as well to, to you know, counteract this eloquent speeches they're coming up with to convince the king of blah, blah, blah to do the thing. Uh, one one key to avoid that kind of stuff is to just like force your players to have to make their roles for you know charm, charisma, manipulation, all that kind of stuff before they describe what they're saying. And when possible, yourself don't talk too much in character unless you really feel like you have a voice for what the character is going to say in the moment. You know, for the most part, as a DM, have your NPCs, you know, operate like you describe, and then he tells you this stuff, and then you can tell them the stuff. You don't, don't tell them the stuff in the voice of the bartender. Just tell them that the bartender tells them this kind of a thing. Also, uh, you, you need to, like, all scenes are potentially encounters, and I, I think in general people need to expand the scope of what they're, they're they're calling encounters. For one thing, especially if you're playing like a D20 type game, doing so allows you to uh, reward experience for different kinds of activities which can encourage different kinds of behavior out of your players. Part of the reason why you have the murder hobo phenomenon is because that's how you excel and advance in the game is by murdering things and taking their shit. So if you find other ways for people to earn experience for defeating a foe, that doesn't necessarily mean clubbing the death them to death like a baby seal in the night. Well, you need to go into all your social encounters and think of them the same way as 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 large extended skill challenges that the characters have to get through. You know, getting into the castle to see the king should be a whole string of social encounters that the characters have to pass to finally get permission to go see the man on top. Uh, there should you should always try to have there be some sort of level of stakes. To any sort of dialogue driven scene that's going on it, it shouldn't just be the players just talking amongst themselves that that's not really what we're here for it's not what I'm here for um, you're, you're, you design your encounters so that even if it is dialogue driven there, there's always some sort of sense of tension of failure and there's there's something that could go bad for the players that might not lead, necessarily lead to their death but there, there's something that they are concerned about that's in question that can be resolved or made worse by whatever the dialogue seeing there is, there, that they're in is. Um, also, you know, the, the idea that plot lines are bad in role-playing games. Like, A, you know, yes, we, you, we want to avoid that kind of immature DMing where you've basically written out the plot of a novel and you're going to railroad your players to go through this chain of events no matter what. That, that is, you know, not necessarily the best kind of DMing style. But the idea that you reject the entire notion of plot at all, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's unrealistic and kind of just blinding yourself to what's going on. You know, what a role-playing game has is an emergent plot. It, it's a, kind of the illusion of plot. And there's nothing wrong with using the word plot to describe it. Because you have a chain of events leading from the beginning to the end, and even if that plot is simply you're going into the next room to kill the goblin after you've left the last room and killed that goblin, that's that's still a plot. Uh, for a role-playing game, you want to give people choices as to how they go about getting through that plot. Instead of go to the next room to fight the goblin, it's you have three different hallways to get through to get to the room with the goblin, but it might not lead you to that goblin, so... 
You might have to take a couple different side steps before you get turned around. Uh, you build choices into things. And if you design combat that way and you design dungeon encounters that way, then you should have a similar philosophy uh, that gets built in to your, your social kind of challenges. And uh, just, you know, in general, like, you know, yeah, I get it. The World of Darkness, it's, it's, it ended badly. Like, the, uh, the, the entire plot line, the way they delivered Gehenna and the Apocalypse and the Ascension and Time of Judgment, which was just like, just we're going to sweep everything else that we left out into a dustbin and resolve it all in one book. Um, that, that odd Orpheus game. I, you know, you know, I loved White Wolf. I still really enjoy White Wolf, but it, it did end badly. Part of it, it's not that they shouldn't have tried to end it that way, but like, why the fuck didn't it end in the year 1999? And then they waited to like 2002 or something before they finally capped off the series. You're, you're, you're a, a, a 90s associated gothic apocalyptic role-playing game brand, and you have 1999 coming, and you have years to plan for it, I guess it was just that old, you know, quest for more money that kept them wanting to put out books. But if that was going to be their philosophy, then they never should have ended it at all. And then there's all that weirdness with the lawsuit with the Underworld movies. And like, you know, right after they lost the lawsuit, suddenly we getting a massive reboot of all the World of Darkness games. And now they're all boring. I mean, I guess Vampire Requiem followed the basic formula of the original vampire and that was all well and good your little social coterie of vampires and you're controlling your city yada 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 but mage the awakening was terrible like i, I remember reading it and like like what what do you do with this except just hang out and talk about magic with your friends uh werewolf the forsaken terrible the the original world of darkness games had a lot of good to be mined out of them and so, some of the thing I kind of want to bring up is like, kind of my thoughts on how to resurrect the original World of Darkness. It's not that you ignore the, the, the Apocalypse, Gehenna, and all that. Uh, I feel like there's a way to use that to filter out the World of Darkness's real true flaw. And that is, as the World of Darkness progressed and they kept adding more titles and more side books and more options... They took something that was supposed to be rare and special, which is this monstrous character hiding in the shadows of human society, and it just kind of became a joke. There's, 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 it's overpopulated. There's too much of them. It's one thing to accept you might have ten vampires hanging out in New Orleans secretly amongst themselves, and, and humans around them are kind of blind, don't notice the few bodies here and there that go missing. It's another thing to say that you got your ten vampires living there. They got a bunch of ghouls. Uh, there's a werewolf sept just outside the city. You got a, a couple changeling freeholds in the city. Uh, two or three different factions of mages operate around New Orleans or have, you know, um, havens there, safe houses, sanctuaries. I can't remember what the hell they were called now. Uh, sanctums. Uh, you know, and of course New Orleans is going to have a bunch of wraiths. Oh, you know, and you have your side things, you got your minor sorcerers, and there's probably some government agents and some vampire hunters, and then towards the end, they're throwing in, you know, Demon the Fallen, and you got mummies showing up. Um, there's so much stuff going on that the value of, of any one of these individual things is, is lessened. And so, if you allow part of the apocalypse to have gone through, you can have a World of Darkness reboot set in the year 2020, 2021, set right now, uh, that that kind of cleans a bit of that up. Uh, just go ahead and assume that Cain came and killed off all the vampires and they're all dead. Fine, we're all tired of that shit anyway. Uh, the werewolves had their battle with the worm at the Red Star and they never came back. But Pentex is still around and the world's still chugging along. Uh, the mages ascended. Changelings have had their winter and all the glamour in the world is gone. The autumn people won and there's no more, you know, chimera and freeholds left to be found. Um, the stuff I would keep, Demon, Demon kind of actually, uh, it's, it's got a flaw in its writing in that the first half of it is all told from the point of view of like a first person short story, which is a terrible approach to write a role playing game. I don't even like having snippets of that in role playing games. I always find it annoying. And in that book's case, that's like the, the whole big first third of the book that's supposed to tell you about the setting and history is all like some gumshoe demon 
short story and it's terrible. But if you can get past that and like, you know, dig through the information in the other halves of the book, you have something that's actually a pretty kind of odd marriage between vampire and changelings dynamics. And I find that rather interesting. And in terms of filling the power void left by the vampires, if you're removing them from the setting, the demons would be a natural fit for many ways, especially because of their attraction to cities and all that. Uh, for werewolves, they're not gone. Uh, not technically, like, you know, the werewolves that went to go fight the worm, that entire generation of werewolves, you know, didn't come back. But their kinfolk are still be around. And those kinfolk would have children. And those children have a small percentage chance of being born a werewolf or some other changing breed. And those kinfolk maybe don't hold the same kind of grudges between each other the way that the, the werewolf tribes did. And so, you know, a few years later... A kid could be born to them who right around this point on the timeline would be manifesting their werewolf powers and then you have kind of an odd werewolf game where like the only people they have to rely on are their kinfolk there's like no other there's no adult werewolves to teach them their things they have they're forced to have to like search out and find spirits and just even get their basic gifts that come with their characters don't give it to them you know the, it less so much you know, the constant, you know, over-the-top Captain Planet fighting Fomori kind of a campaign, at least at first. And, and more of like, you know, a lot of searching out your origins and trying to discover this lost past and figure out what the hell's going on. And maybe seeing what, other, what others of your kind you can find out there. And then lead on to like the, why is Pentex still here? What's up with that? You know, what, what is the status between the worm, the weaver, and the wild? That you can all leave to yourself. I would also bring uh, Mummy back in. Uh, the problem with Mummy um, in general is that because of the whole like mystic web thing that they're dependent on to like maintain their, their immortality, they're kind of wedded to Egypt and the Middle East. But I would dare say if we're going to be contriving a bunch of shit already in a game where you can play a mystically reborn Mummy, um, you know, like the last 20 years, because of the War on Terror, there's actually been quite an expansion of... Middle Eastern populations and to other parts of the world, so I'd say we could rather easily just contrive the idea that uh, the web of life has expanded so that mummies can now, you know, do their thing everywhere and not only in a small little corner of the planet. Uh, they're kind of another alternative that would kind of re somewhat replace both mages and vampires in the setting and some of the ways they operate. Maybe a bit more of a, like, automatically good aligned kind of faction and then other than that i would just bring in maybe a few of the side things um a good starting point for playing characters from a more modern lens would actually be project twilight having them play fbi agents investigating all this kind of shit <coughs> excuse me uh, another good one sorcerer as a, a kind of a replacement for mage uh, the, the lower hedge magic users and their cults are kind of like, in the way that the, the demons are kind of struggling amongst themselves to fill the niche of the vampires, the, all these minor sorcerer clans are suddenly now the top powers of magic on the earth and, you know, they could be having all sorts of, you know, plot lines going back, plot lines going back and forth, you know, between them. And I think another uh, good one that would fit into this kind of latter-day reborn World of Darkness would be the Inquisition. For obvious reasons. It pairs well with Demon. And that's it. Have a good one. Hit like and subscribe. Tell me in the comments what a fucking moron I am for liking the World of Darkness and trying to convince you that it's not as terrible of a game as you've told yourself it is. And be sure to stay waspidated.